break. I'm sorry to do the border collie thing and hurt everybody back in, but that's how it goes. Sonia Sanchez wrote a haiku for Harriet Tubman. Picture a woman riding thunder on the legs of slavery. Welcome to panel two, colonial and racial historical legacies and their impact on feminist justice. Histories of colonialism, imperialism, slavery, among other racial oppressions are nearer than they appear in time. And their legacies continue to impact feminist struggles. Central questions such as what is defined as womanness itself in a context where women, including trans women and non-binary people marginalized by race have been excluded from the conversation to the difficulties of having a shared understanding of what race means in the feminist struggle against gender-based violence, these questions need to be critically thought through. Thinking about black or women of color, feminist politics is often not rooted in African and Caribbean, Indian and South Asian or Dalit and Adivasi feminisms and decolonial approaches, while diasporic voices sometimes carry an unequal degree of visibility. How can these histories be recognized and these practices be incorporated into an understanding of the harms that continue to be perpetuated in contemporary feminisms? The panel will, dis will include discussions on rage and radical rudeness, facing the backlash, bodily autonomy, colonial gender legacies of violence and penal codes, caste and funding and donor relationships based on colonialism and its legacy. Our panelists for this discussion, of whom we're happy to have four right here with us, are Her Excellency Abina Busia, Kalpana Wilson, Magdalena Grabowska, Stella Nianzi, and Tatiana Latinovic. Marai Larasi is panel chair. Organizer, consultant, and educator, Marai is a black, African, Caribbean, British feminist advocate, community organizer, and consultant who has worked in social justice for over 25 years with a specific focus on ending violence against black, global majority women and girls. Till May 2019, she was the executive director of IMCAN and has been co-chair of the End Violence Against Women Coalition. Marai currently is professor in practice in the Department of Sociology at Durham University, England, which gives me the right to call her Professor Marai, which I'm going to do. And before I give the floor to Marai, I'd like to remind everyone that speaker addresses by Kalpana Wilson and Stella Nancy are available on the conference platform, and we hope you've had the time to listen or watch them, uh, go through them. As before, please feel free to submit questions for the panel via Slido, sli.do, on the live stream that you'll find on the virtual panel, and also um, use the number hashtag 704730 if you're using the app. And I leave you in the capable hands of Professor Marai Larassi. Ancestral and warrior greetings. It's indeed good to be a part of this moment. Geeti, I should never have told you about that professor mm. thing. I knew you would have used it against me at some point. So wherever you are in the world, um, thank you for being part of this conversation. Thank you to every survivor who dreamed a different world and who continues to make that world possible. For those who continue to be silenced, we commit to listening to you even through the walls of injustice and violence. Thank you to the amazing humans who imagined and manifested this event. Thank you to the visionaries, the outrageous, outraged, the warriors, the freedom fighters who keep the liberation fires burning. My name, as Giti says, is Marai Larisai, and I have the honor and privilege of chairing this session. And I'm so sorry I couldn't be there physically. I'm really hoping that my internet and computer behave. Um, so we're joined today by a most amazing group of thinkers, dreamers, warriors, strategists, intellectual powerhouses, and in my mind, and whether you call yourself this or not, I'm calling you revolutionaries. In a moment, I will introduce each panelist, um, but just before that, a word about this conversation on colonial and racial historical legacies and their impact on feminist justice. And I think Giti and the team asked me to chair this panel because 
This is something that is so close to my heart. As, was, how, as has already surfaced in the previous panel, for many of us, it is impossible for us to conceptualize and live our feminism without engaging with the painful legacies and ongoing presence of colonialism, including manifestations of white supremacy, ableism, heteronormativity, and that shadow demon called respectability. In my case, as an African and Caribbean queer feminist troublemaker and survivor of interpersonal and systemic violence, I'm not objective or neutral. How can I be? And why would I want to be? I'm not only marked by colonization, I'm a product of the European colonial project, a bit like the white rum or the sugar. As a descendant of enslaved peoples trafficked across the Atlantic to labor in European plantations, and also a descendant of those who enacted that violence, I literally have skin in the game. I have no feminism without emancipatory practice, which is decolonial and disruptive, and which includes demands for reparative action rather than aid and benevolence. And today, each of our panel members will offer their own perspective on these themes. Uh, as Giti said, if you haven't had a chance to view the recordings by Stella and Kalpana, I encourage you to do so. Also to say, I cannot do justice to the bios of these amazing humans that are seated amongst us. So if you haven't read their bios online, please do so. And now over to this group of resistance. Introducing Her Excellency Abena Lucia, who is currently serving as Ghana's ambassador to Brazil, and who is also a professor in the departments of English and Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. Galpana Wilson, lecturer in the Geography Department at Birkbeck University of London. Magdalena Grabowska, and Magdalena, I hope I'm not messing up your name, Associate Professor at Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Dr. Stella Nayanzi, who is a multiple award-winning medical anthropologist with specialization in sexual and reproductive health, sexual rights, and human sexualities. Tatiana Latinovich, president of Icelandic Women's Rights Association, having served as vice chair from 2015 to 2019. Um, Professor Basia, can I ask you to start the conversation for us? And can I ask panelists to keep your initial comments to two to three minutes so that we can have a fruitful exchange of ideas? And, and after Professor Basia, um, Kalpana, if you can then just take over and we can just keep the ball rolling. So thank you. Thank you very much. And it is an honor to be here. And I really personally must take a few seconds of my two minutes to really thank the organizers of this conference for even getting me here. You have no idea <laughs> what they had done. <laughs> and that they were organizing the conference and planning their own presentations and so on while listening to me hysterically saying, I don't have my visa, I, I don't have my card, I don't have my this, and I don't have a table in my room, and they fixed it all. So thank you very much. Um, it is really a privilege to be here. And um, I wasn't expecting to begin this way, but I am. I want to really endorse, please, if you have not listened to Kalpana and Stella's presentations that are the background to this, please, 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 please do so. Because they really highlight some of the really important things, which for me, boils down to really history matters. History matters. And what matters is both collective history and personal history. Because peop we are working in terms of policy transformation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the context, as we heard in the last panel, of our collective national histories. And I just want to say a brief comment on the last panel. You know, we need to be careful because the even the term, um, what was it, conventional justice, traditional justice systems, they are not conventional for some of us. That is to say, some of us still live with alternative forms of justice making in our daily lives, 
which are sometimes radically at odds with the systematic national systems of criminal justice, etc., which is what we are signaling when we say conventional or traditional justice um, systems. And I think that that's important because it's at the heart of what a lot of us are, are going to say. But, but what I'm saying is that when working for justice, when you're looking at violence against women and you are structuring, you're trying to see how you can get that transformed on a large level, you are looking at both those national, global in some instances, forms of justice, but the healing that is necessary, the healing that drives the movement has to be personal because you are talking about an individual person who has been violated, who needs to be healed and must be healed. And so you are talking about that, that personal history whose responses to that violation are personal, and yet trying to work out a larger, you know, UN, you know, kind of national system of how can this individual person be restored. And I think that a lot of the tensions that we face in our work is holding that intention holding those issues in tension, on top of which we have to hold in tension the power structures under which we work. And as Kalpana reminded us, that for women of color, we are frequently outside the concepts of humanity that guide those structures of um, empowerment and even constitute the sense of justice. Um, Women, even, you know, women in general, not, no, not only specifically women of color, we're very even outside the notions of citizenship in our countries. And all you need to do is to look at who can and cannot pass on citizenship to their children under what conditions to see the ways in which even simple things like who can get a passport. You know, if you're a woman, for the most part, you have to be married to the father of your child and give birth to your child in the country in which you are a citizen to guarantee that your child can be a citizen of your country. But that's a tangent. I just want to say that for a lot of women, we do not fall under the great rubric of the ideal citizen that is being, that these justice systems are operating under. And it's even more so with women of color who are dealing with the legacies of empire, the residues of colonialism, the continuing st structures of settler colonialism. I mean, on the continent of Africa, down to the borders in which we live and the languages in which we conduct legal national business. Um, and therefore, the educational systems that we inhabit. Um, all of those things come into play. The educational systems which we inhabit are vital because, for instance, what constitutes wisdom? What constitutes knowledge? We all live under systems of education under which our local knowledge is very often not considered formal knowledge. Right up until two decades ago, I don't know if it, was cha it has changed yet, but there were many countries on the continent of Africa which, where you were considered literate only if you spoke a European language. And so you could have somebody like the person who drove my mother at the end of her life, who spoke four indigenous local languages, but was considered literate in one English. Although as a Ghanaian, he, he could speak a, a Nigerian language. I mean, just he spoke Hausa, Ga, Chui, and had smatterings of Yoruba, but he was considered literate in English. 
You know, those kinds of ideas and ideologies. My, my mother was a midwife, and I remember one time walking with her in the streets, and she saw somebody who she could tell by the shape of his head that he had been born breech. And she said, we were taught how to turn babies so that you could, they, you know, you could guide them. But today, how are we taught in medical schools how to turn a breech baby? No, you're told have an epidural, we're gonna give you a C-section. So even those things as what is considered knowledge are the kinds of things that we need to think about. Um, and for a lot of us, we have to grapple with white privilege. We have to grapple with white privilege even from those of us who are, those sisters who are marching with us in solidarity because those structures are invisible. The most difficult structures to change are the ones we don't see. And those are always, 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 it's like you know that joke about asking a fish, how's the water today? Um, you know, we don't notice air until it gets polluted. And we need to grapple with the things that we take for granted and disaggregate all of those. And there are, my examples of why those things are important are all little ones, like going to the Beijing conference and going to the NGO, the, the briefing for the formal um, national thing on, to the MGO community on something like the girl child. And knowing fully well that the issue of the girl child was on the Beijing platform because of the women of the Global South. It was African women and South Asian women who pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for those clauses on the girl child to be in the Beijing platform. And we get to Beijing, we get to the briefing, and who is conducting the conversations about the clauses on the girl child? Euro-American women with the best intentions, but Euro-American women, and you think, how did we get here? And we got here because of the structures of communication who has available, who has access, who could be in New York on the day. Simple things like that. I realize I've run out of my two minutes. I'm just sort of pointing out the complexity of the things that we need to take, take into account if we are going to insist that our knowledge is in the things that we know and the things that are personal can have a larger context. We cannot ignore the context under which we labor, which have very, very complicated histories for all of us. And I will end there, because I wasn't timing, but I think my two minutes is <laughs> way up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Professor Bissé. So I'm going to hand over to Kalpana now. And then after Kalpana, um, Magdalena, if you can get ready. Thanks, Marai, and um, I'd just like to say that was such a kind of seminal contribution from um, Professor Busia. So, um, you know, really brilliant start to the, the session. And um, I just wanted to really add um, three points which I felt would kind of be things which we should be thinking about perhaps in addition to or at an extension of the really important agenda which we've already got before us. And the first thing is really about this movement we're in right now globally, where we have this huge rise in fascism and far-right movements and regimes and what that means um, when we're talking about fighting um, gender violence. Um, here in the UK where I'm based, um, you know, just a few days ago, we saw this uh, multiple murder by someone who's uh, defined as an incel. Now, we all know what does that actually mean. It's really about um, misogyny, racism, and, and white supremacy, right? That's what that actually means. Um, but those people, you know, they, they're not actually these uh, lone wolves, so-called. They get their legitimacy, they get their confidence, from far-right governments, like the one we have in the UK, where our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has called Muslim women letterboxes, and where you know there's this 
deep structured racism affecting every aspect of the lives of black women, of Muslim women, of racialized women in, in Britain. Um, and, you know, we have regimes like this now proliferating across the world. We have openly fascist regimes across the global south in India, which, you know, I talked about in my video, in Brazil, in the Philippines, and many other places, which I'm sure the panel has a rich knowledge about. Um, and here we see really the orchestration of these unimaginable levels of, of violence against uh, women who are racialized, who are minoritized in these countries. We see the demonization of feminist movements where you know, they, are, they are defined as being against the nation. Um, we see reproductive violence on all kinds of levels. Um, but the thing about fascism today in the global south, and this is kind of my second point, is that it's inseparable from imperialism, right? Which is why... Um, all the big corporations are so happy to see these regimes on the rise. Um, and I think imperialism is a really important uh, word for us to use because while colonial legacies are incredibly important, colonial histories are incredibly important, um, and I think you know that point was made so powerfully just now um, by Professor Visea, but I also think we need to think then about what colonialism and imperialism looks like right now materially, because we're still having these huge kind of um, huge plunder, huge extraction of resources. Um, and the agents of this imperialism today are things like the World Bank, like the IMF, um, organizations like the EU and NATO. Um, and then, of course, you know, the so-called philanthrocapitalists, the Bill Gates of this world. Um, and all of these international NGOs, right? And these, these agents of imperialism, they talk all the time about gender equality. They talk all the time about empowering women in the global south. But what do they mean by that? What they mean is very different from what feminist movements in those places mean by it. What they're really talking about is getting women into global labor markets, intensifying their exploitation adding to the huge burden of work which they already have. Um, and now I think many of us right now are probably thinking about uh, Afghanistan and the situation there and how, you know, what some kind of meaningful feminist solidarity could really look like. And I, I'm not go going to go into it. I think we all know the history, right? We all know uh, the central role of the U.S. in creating the situation we really know about what happened in the 80s, we know about the, the occupation in the 2000s and the terrible colonial violence. Um, but today we've got a situation where women, you know, are, uh, you know, in danger of losing the kind of rights which they themselves have fought for, not for ones that they were given by anybody else. And the one thing then that really perhaps could um, save lives, a lot of activists are saying, is if borders are open, right? If in the global north, you know, people can actually come to these countries. And of course, that's not going to happen because my third point I wanted to make was about borders and about borders as a system of gender, gendered and racialized violence, right? The way genders are essential to maintaining these systems of, of inequality globally. Um, and coming back to the UK again, um, we only look, need to look at Yarl's Wood, which is a detention center, an immigration detention center, where specifically women are incarcerated. And these are women who have um, escaped, they're survivors of the most horrendous gender violence, torture, and so on. And yet they are now incarcerated in this institution where they are facing yet more sexual abuse. You know, in we only have to remember in the UK again, the case of Joy Gardner, the case of Joy Gardner, a Jamaican woman uh, who was murdered by the police and the immigration service in the course of an attempt to deport her in front of her five-year-old son. So 
That third thing then is that we must look, I think, in today's world at the questions of borders and what those mean for, for violence, which is acutely gendered and racialized. Um, so I think my time is up, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. So just going alphabetically, uh, Magdalena, can I hand over to you, please? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, organizers, for including me in this panel and in this uh, conversation. And following the, movie, the videos that are online, I wanted to um, start my initial comments with talking about how legacies of colonialism, imperialism, and racial oppression that impact feminist struggles in Poland and in Eastern Europe more generally are quite specific and ambivalent in at least three historical ways. Uh, first, there, are, there is a legacy of 18th, 19th, and 20th century intra-European colonialism within, e within which Eastern Europe states were colonized from both capitalistic West, but also communist East, Russia and the Soviet Union. There were moreover, in many cases, such as, such as Poland, not only colonized, but also colonizers of their fellow Eastern European states. In case of Poland, that is the case of Ukraine and Lithuania. These, cre these legacies create a context within which Eastern Europe feminisms sit uneasily within post-colonial and transnational feminist debates. And there is a need to think through what these local, local legacies of colonization and racialization mean in the feminist struggles against um, gender-based violence. Second, there is a legacy of post-Second post World War communism that emancipated women in Poland and in Eastern Europe in unprecedented way, providing measures related to protection of motherhood, legal abortion, uh, labor rights, and civil liberties already in 1940s and 1950s, way before these were achieved in uh, some of the Western European countries in the late 1960s and 1970s. These achievements, however, are largely forgotten within dominant liberal and predominantly anti-communist narratives that represent state socialism, state socialist emancipation as unwanted imperialistic Soviet Union legacy. And finally, there are ambivalent legacies of post-communist transformations of the 1990s that brought up certain possibilities for feminist movements, but also often led to re-emergence of nationalism, xenophobia, and forced the liberal cultural feminism onto Eastern Europe. The model based on donor chasing within which Eastern Europe was represented as delayed or lagging when compared to the rest of the continent. It is, it is within and against this background that feminism in Poland now struggle against physical, institutional, systemic and symbolic violence against women and marginalized group in the political reality of ongoing backlash against what is called gender or LGBT and LGBTQ ideology. And you might have heard, for example, about the so-called LGBTQ uh, free zones in Poland or uh, the threats to withdraw Istanbul Convention. Some of you may also seen photos from Poland from the late 2020 when hundreds and thousands of people, mostly young and mostly women, stepped outside in a social mobilization against further restrictions on the abortion law. Recent protests exemplified mobilization that arises from intense emo emotional experience, affective response from the vivid sense that something is wrong. And they were thus example of politics of emotion, which has an ability to transform what seems to be private into a public. Moreover, anger, fury, and outright rage were when manifested in the protest slogans, among them best known, get the fuck out, and fuck peace, peace being the ruling party. And the strategy of radical rudeness that, is, that utilizes public insult to challenge patriarchal structures of power, and I'm quoting uh, Stella Nianzi here, brought about unexpected positive results in Poland. As uh, one of the Polish authors, Inga Iwasiew, put, put it, the moment we started to be vulgar, the other side started to listen. Central questions to these new struggles are certainly those of bodily autonomy, reproductive justice, and institu institutional violence, fighting institutional violence against the government, of the government. But I also center on, center on questions about what is defined as a womanness in a context where women, persons marginalized by ethnicity, gender, and physical and intellectual ability have been excluded from the conversations. Radical solidarity as a form of Eastern European intersectionality uh, and understood as a way of connecting and communicating across differences and from the bottom up, rather than top to, bar to the bottom, top down, seems to be the force that drives these movements. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, can I now hand over to Stella? Uh, you, you, you are literally sat in order. It's as if you knew that I was going to do it alphabetically. So you just like literally <laughs> positioned yourself perfectly. Stella, over to you. Right. Thank you very much. I think we sat like this because of Eileen, and I mentioned <laughs> her name because she's so special to me. I wouldn't be here physically if. Um, she had not carried the Norwegian embassy in Kenya, which is neighboring my own country, Uganda, to give me a visa. And so the point which um, Kaplana made or Kalpana made about borders is important. And I want to start there in uh, a way of appreciating those who made it possible for me to be here. Often when we have global movements, some of us are excluded. And I want to thank you for that history from Beijing where global Southern women made a push and then the people who were articulating for us about us were not us, <laughs> right? Um, and so thank you so much for making us present. And I think for me in terms of the, the video I made was to kind of introduce a notion of guilt into those who think they will always think for others and um, that their knowledge making always makes sense for others, especially the excluded, that sometimes it's important to look, we were talking about kale kaleidoscopic justice in the previous panel. And I was thinking, even in the kaleidoscope, there are those who are missing and I think what history has taught me uh, is that we must look for the invisibilized. So my first point for this panel is that even when we make these agendas and we set these movements, often they are excluded people. Mm -hmm. I think we have talked a lot about intersectionality and we're talking about race and class and woman bodies, but I think that into the conversation Colonial history has excluded the transgender person, as, at least in the colonized states. And so transgender women, to what extent are they welcome to our feminist gatherings? And to what extent do we make it impossible for them to even participate? I think that's one question I wanted to raise. Invisibilization is real. In terms of healing, how do we heal ourselves from trauma as we embody? in languages that don't even represent how we understand healing, right? And so when we make regimens of healing that totally exclude how I approach healing, maybe it's ancestral, maybe it's communal, maybe it's collective, maybe it has nothing to do with individual psychology or whatever it is, how then do I even come to the table if healing is spoken in languages that totally exclude me? That's the second point. And so invisibilization, erasure, silencing, exclusion are important beyond what's visible, especially for those of us who have been traumatized and um, made psychotic <laughs> by the very systems that try to heal us. And I say this as a black woman, I say this as a person often who is uh, allowed to come to tables as a token, right? The third thing I want to say perhaps is that we um, must insist on being visible even when we are invisibilized. And that many times the languages of respectability, which I think Jessica in the first panel referred to, and she says we must be disruptive and we must be radical and we must cut off men's genitals. I think she says, take men out of government, but in my radically vulgar language, what I would say is let's cut their balls, not so much to castrate them, but to introduce the language with which, when we struggle for language, what do we do? We appeal to that which makes sense to us. And maybe it is considered rude or unnecessary or discomfortable, but sometimes it's the only way to grab attention. And I want to say that for many of us who are now having to work in global movements where we must squeeze a little space for ourselves, it's important to enter these spaces on our terms. And I speak this as a feminist who has been told by feminists that using nudity 
is not acceptable. So I'm a nude protester who grabs attention from the public, from presidents, from scholars, and from whoever wants to be grabbed by the body of a black woman <laughs> to raise my issue. And I think part of my shock and trauma is when feminists, black feminists, white feminists, brown feminists, thought it was pornographic for a professor to protest in court with her nude body. I juggled my breasts <laughs> before the magistrate. And I think for me, the, the issue was to say, look, I don't speak the language of the courts. I don't understand the power structures and the hierarchies which we inherited from colonizers. And when I was not taken to be present in court for my sentencing after I was convicted and I was put in a male prison <laughs> surrounded by male guards and I was surrounded with men by guns and put on television, I thought they think they're going to have the last laugh. But because I had been practiced in the ways of my people, the histories of African women resistance, mm -hmm. I knew that when women are pushed to the end, we throw off our clothes. And in court, surrounded by uh, prison wardresses and on national television, they were capturing me on national television. They gave me a platform. I thought, what would my ancestors have done? And I threw off that prison uniform, you know? <laughs> wasn't celebrated like you're celebrating the feminists in my country, in East Africa, in Africa, in the academic papers. They say she's gone cuckoo. No. Okay? Just to say to me that because we don't know our history exactly. as African women, we denigrate even what our ancestors would have done. My grandmothers were walking around naked. Or for respectability, when they were in their periods, they'd wear a, wine, a loincloth, right? So when someone says to me, oh, it's so vulgar, we can't protest this way, they have imbibed and embodied Western notions of respectability. Mm -hmm. And I guess to enter this conversation for me is to say we must insist on our own terms to make meaning of our own healing and trauma and claim spaces. Is it respectable all the time? I don't care. I'm looking for justice on my terms because in the courts I was given injustice. So I guess what I'm saying is history is important. History is not innocent. We have been colonized even when we consider ourselves independent as former colonial subjects. My country is independent. We still have a penal code from the Brits. And the Brits have, you know, empowered themselves and restored, you know, all these, because criminal justice makes sense to them. We are still stuck with what they were stuck with in the 30s when they colonized us. And so criminal justice for me can be quite unjust. Mm -hmm. And so how does a powerless person use history. I think history can be harmful for colonized people. History can also be very empowering. And what I do with history is to find ways I can decolonize it and recreate an archive where we are present. If anybody studies the history of my lifetime, they'll know there was a rebel woman and I will make history and I have entered an archive that invisibilizes women survivors that are black. I was looking for histories of women who had miscarriages in prison during colonial time because I was beaten and tortured by prison wardresses and I lost my baby. And there was no role model, right? But now I have entered that archive because now I know, people know she was brutalized in, in, and tortured in, in prison. And I try to make my story visible through the public media. But you know what? They said she is lying. Don't believe her, just like the rapist who's told, don't believe that rapist she was wearing too short a skirt. I was told I was a rebel. And so I have tried to challenge the prison services system in Uganda today. I don't have a place to go to in terms of history. How have women in Africa or elsewhere challenged prison services that brutalize and violate them? So history is important to be drawn on or drawn out of or learned from, received from, but I think we must insist on making history as well and entering those archives that otherwise silenced, invisibilized, erased, did not make a record of us. 
And so I think histories, has stories, and queer stories, because we are all sorts of stories to tell. Thank you so much. In terms of introduction, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nancy. I, it's a pity you couldn't hear me clicking. I was like oh, that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't I can <laughs> give up my no, you, no, I mean clicking like no. this is poetry. <laughs> oh. I was like that. Yes, okay. yes. Um, so, um, Tatiana Latinovich, uh, president of Icelandic Women's Rights Association, um, you, have, you now have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inspiring talk. Thank you for the videos that, that uh, we listened to and um, uh, for, for this conference. Uh, I am, uh, as everybody else here, really in shock still with, about what is happening in Afghanistan, what is happening in Haiti. I come from the war-torn country myself and, and really my heart bleeds uh, for this. I will t I'll talk about the Icelandic situation because I come, I, I live in Iceland, I've lived here for 27 years and, and as, as uh, I was introduced, I am a president of Icelandic Women's Rights Association. I really like this, um, uh, the, the notion of the history matters, her story matters. Uh, it matters really uh, what we're creating here, but it matters also in, in case of uh, immigrant women, what we bring with us to the new country uh, that we're fortunate enough to live with, and also how this country uh, perceives us. Uh, so while we cannot compare the situation in Iceland to decades and centuries long oppression of, of racism and colonialism, uh, I think there are definitely threats of, of unjust hierarchies and institutional dislocation uh, of immigrant population in, in general, and more specifically women, that one could argue that original from similar social structures as in other parts of the world. So even though Iceland is an island, it's not an island, it learns from others. And so um, just to give people from, not from Iceland, visiting Iceland in a uh, sort of uh, uh, setup, the uh, Iceland has experienced very sharp rise in immigration in last uh, years. I moved here 27 years ago. I think there were like 4,000 4, foreigners living here. Today there are 50,000 mm -hmm. and uh, around 52,000. Most, uh, it's 14% of the total population and um, uh, slightly above 1,000 people, foreign nationals come every quarter to the country, most of them come from uh, EU countries, from Poland. And uh, so how are they perceived? Uh, yes, and I wanted also to mention, because this is a follow-up to Me Too conference in 2019. I gave a speech there about the, uh, spoke about the Me Too movement of foreign women, because we organized ourselves in a group, a separate group, because we saw in this big Me Too movement, there were no or very few foreign names in other groups. So there was a group of around 600 foreign women that organized and shared their stories that were horrible. And uh, uh, what touched me as, as, as I was introduced, I've been an uh, activist in 2003 in Iceland, organized the uh, uh, co-founder co of Women in Iceland, Foreign Women's Association. What uh, struck me most and what was really um, horrible to hear is that some women, well, quite a few women in that group said that they moved to Iceland hoping that they were coming to paradise on earth, equality paradise on earth, but they didn't see it and they did not partake and they did not benefit from, from all the advances in, in gender equality that Iceland had. So the question is, why is that? And, and I have few, you know, I don't have the answer, uh, but, um, uh, we called then for, for several changes to be, to be made, and some of them have been made, but a lot of them not. And I don't think that we have experienced the paradigm sh shift that I was asking for, uh, uh, to, to include you know, the intersectionality in all approaches to, 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 to equality. So mo majority of immigrants come here to work, and uh, are actually sought by Isla Icelandic industry, and so their contribution in terms of work is quite appreciated. However, many of them are at the bottom of the, of the ladder, 
on a scale. So uh, uh, immigrant issues, even when discussed, are often connected to work and to the contribution of, of, of immigrants to uh, GPD or, or, to, uh, or to the society. And um, we did a few years ago, the first wage gap analysis was done based on origin. Uh, by statistics of Iceland, and it showed that the uh, at minimum 8% to 25% wage difference uh, that cannot be explained by anything else by uh, than ethnicity. And even that, uh, it mattered where you came from. It mattered if you're immigrant from Nordic countries. I don't think you consider yourself immigrant if you come from Nordic countries or from America or something. But if you come from Eastern Europe, Asia or Africa, you know, you're, you're way behind. The second one, second dimension of so foreigners being on the receiving end of services and welfare uh, that cost the society. Here we also have discussion of asylum seekers and refugees. And so whenever we discuss in, in the system, in the structure, uh, the, the, the f immigrants, we do not ex discuss it as a quality issue, we discuss it as a welfare issue which I think is the biggest uh, fail that we are still doing. And the third dimension then, the one that silences us and perhaps has the most influence on immigrant activism is the question of language, of Icelandic yeah. language. And uh, which is strongly associated by, with Icelandic identity. So while I have learned the language and I, strong, I love Icelandic and I strongly believe that people feel better living in society that they speak the language, we still hear that people are illiterate or, or then don't speak, you know, if, they, if they don't write Latin alphabet. You know, it, it, it comes a lot of Asian pe people from Asia, for example. So, um, there is, and there is also at any time the large amount of, of foreigners coming to Iceland that have just arrived to Iceland. They have lived here for a short time. As I said, they come like a thousand a quarter. So, so there's always a group of people, maybe the most vulnerable women that, that will not be able to, they just don't know Icelandic because they haven't had the chance to learn it before and they cannot uh, uh, perceive it. So um, on top of that, even when we speak Icelandic to the best of our abil abilities uh, and, and have a message to convey, have something to contribute, we will uh, first have to handle the, the, this, the, the barrier of people listening to us and judging how good Icelandic we speak, not, not, not what, we, what we talk about. So uh, there is always this divide institutionally of immigrant, immigrant women's issues being treated separately from the Icelandic society uh, in, in total. And uh, I don't know if you have, I don't probably have time. I think I'm out, out of time. I was going to give one anecdote, but I can maybe, uh, mention it later. So I think to, to conclude, I think that we need uh, in order to really achieve uh, equality up to 100%, I think in Iceland we are 87% or something. Uh, I think that we will have to include everyone that lives here on their own terms. Otherwise we will not be, uh, we will be stagnating in, in uh, equality as we are now. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like uh, one of the, the um, mantras coming out of this conversation will be on our own terms. I think that that could be one of the things. So Stella, thank you for dropping that in. I think that's one of the things that I'm going to take away. I don't know about everybody else, but I feel like I just got schooled, which is an awesome thing. Um, I want to just put a couple in terms of building on the conversations that we've, we've had thus far, um, just to remind um, folk out there that you can drop questions in Slido and we're going to pick up um, questions in, in a couple of minutes. Any thoughts from panel members coming back from listening to um, sisters, you know, offering experiences? Um, Abena, have yeah. you got your hand up? Yes, I, I do. Because awesome. I, I wanted to go back to nakedness and radical rudeness. <laughs> because it encapsulates so much about local knowledge, shift, changes, etc. I was distressed to hear you say that even Ugandan feminists didn't understand what you were doing, because in Ghana we would have understood. You know, Kalpana in her presentation 
mentioned the Abba Women's War, which is like the most celebrated moment of um, strategic nakedness that people know about simply because it entered the British records, right? It was, um, it led to a court case and all, and all other kinds of things. But the point about that, this is, you know, 1920s Nigeria, the women were protesting a tax law. And as far as the British were concerned, this bunch of crazy women dressed funny showed up protesting at the, the um, district commissioner's house and the British assumed that the, the cowardly men had encouraged the women to go and protest. But of course what was happening was that the British failed to literally to read the bodies of the women um, because they were dressed in a particular way, carrying particular things in a very traditional form of protest. They were protesting the activities of a specific warrant officer who the British had empowered unauthorizedly. And they had bared their breasts. Now, it worked because the community recognized. You see, unlike the Western popular notion of African women's bodies, um, I always remember my mother being appalled at, you know, the can-can and people parading naked and that kind of thing. Because unlike the Western notion, actually, dress is very specific. And there are certain cultures in which the nakedness of the mother is a curse. And that for to see the nakedness of your mother, especially if she does it on purpose, it is a significant signal and a curse and trouble. It's making war and like you don't. Now, for example, forget 1920s Nigeria. I can tell a story. We're talking late 1990s Ghana. Okay, very political tension. We've just established the Fourth Republic. We've got a military turned civilian president who does not want to deal with opposition. Elections are coming up. Now, it just so happened my aunt was a very high profile politician. She was a, a deputy member, leader of the opposition political party. And, but she had at one point been the matron of the university hall and the, the, the men in the hall were very loyal to her regardless of politics, like, you know, 30 years later, they still remembered the matron who was good to them. One of these men um, inside the ruling party saw a list of people who were going to be arrested. My aunt's name was at the top. And he went straight to her and said, I can't let this happen to you. Please tell your friends. Amongst the friends was the man who was had been the candidate, the political, pan the presidential candidate before and was possibly running again. In the end, he didn't, but. Now, this man was a very soft-spoken, slight-billed, mild-mannered, very, very famous um, Ghanaian historian called Edu Bwahim, one of the people who was in charge of the UNESCO General History of Africa. But his wife? <laughs> his wife was this tough, large, entrepreneur, market woman, and so on. When my aunt told her that they were coming for her husband, she said, let them try it. We're not going anywhere, let them try it. And lo and behold, the next morning, here come these young soldiers coming to arrest her husband. She's standing on the balcony of the house, sees them, and begins. And she starts cursing them out, beginning with taking off her scarf, oh, yeah. and then starting to go down the stairs, by the time she got down the stairs, she was undoing her brassiere. Those soldiers turned and left. Her husband was not arrested. Okay, he was not arrested because they recognized what she was doing. And soldiers with guns though they be, they felt we are not staying around to see this woman take off her clothes in front of us. It is not gonna happen, we're out of here. And they left. Now, it was possible because they still understood what she was doing. It's like this, this issue of, you know, the strange thing, people who you can, only people of faith can blaspheme, 
Otherwise, it's meaningless. You know? so, so my question is, that was a powerful, and it still remains because the woman's body is still sacred. And the nakedness of the mother, therefore, can be used as a curse. I wonder sometimes, that was more than 20 years ago, what is happening if I got mad today in Ghana and started stripping, would they respond like they did to Auntie Mary 20 years ago, or would they respond like they did to you? That is to say, where is our knowledge? Where are our systems of understanding? In the West, the, the nakedness of a woman's body stopped being sacred centuries ago. But in parts of Africa, it is still sacred. And those are the kinds of disjunctures and ruptures and so on that we need to work with and think about and think through. You know, so Kalpana, it wasn't just, you know, 1920 Nigeria. It was still powerful in, in, in Ghana at the turn of this century. How long will it remain powerful? As we say, what are we doing to our own children? Whose archives are they reading? What bodies are they respecting? What kind of knowledge do we have? Because you see, if we lose that knowledge and we lose that idea of taboo, we have lost that particular very, very generative sense of power. <coughs> the Abba Women's War, it was not one woman, they were a crowd of women who did it. You, by the time you did it, you were alone. You should not have been alone. And that is a very powerful shift that we need to consider because it depends on what are we teaching our children. What is, as I said before, what is considered wisdom? What is considered sacred knowledge? And in what languages do we think and speak and, and, and act? And how does that affect us? What stories are known even? because of the curriculum. I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm sorry, so it matters to me. Syllabi matters to, matters. Syllabi matters. Syllabi matter. And, and we're losing control of what we consider proper knowledge, I mm -hmm. think. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thank you, Professor Bossier. Can I just see if anybody from, because I, I'm struck by what this all means in terms of attempting to build global solidarity yeah. how do we how do we think about this if we're talking about movement building how do we you know like um you know dr nancy spoke about you know like on our own on our own terms you know um tatiana spoke about the experience you know the contextual differences you know magda rightfully kind of painted this picture for us around you know, these legacies of colonization in parts of Europe that aren't necessarily defined as colonization. You know, Kalpan has called us in to think about the impact yeah. of all of those legacies like right now. So what does this all mean in terms of how we think about movement building? Mm -hmm. How do we think about what we take away from a space like this? And I ask this because there are a couple of um, questions waiting and I want to be able to get to those questions. I also just want to give you give you all a bit of space just with yourselves to kind of consider like what we're taking away what does this mean for us in terms of coming together with these kind of opportunities any anybody kind of want to jump in um dr nancy yeah. right please call me stella um, Stella. You know what, Stella, I've been jumping back and forth with the first names and the, and the titles, and then I'm like, what if I'm offending people by just using up their first names when people are like, so thank you for giving me permission. Well, for me, just call me Stella. All right, <laughs> Stella, 100%. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so yeah. I think for me, because sometimes when one speaks on own, my own terms, it's very possible to misunderstand them and think that they are trying to push away but I think what I'm inviting is, rather than maybe one size fits all and hierarchies where there's best and not so well, perhaps continuums or circles of possibility mm -hmm. where 
the immigrant in Iceland can speak in Luganda or whatever or whatever, but we're all sitting around, and sitting around the table, of course, has its own inequality issues, but perhaps my possibilities are given some audience and some space at the table. If the table metaphor doesn't work, we smash it and we try something else <laughs> around stringing beads together or something where I could bring a bead of a cowrie shell you bring, I don't know what's in Poland, and you bring, she's Brazilian, Ghanaian, English, American, I don't know what you are, Her Excellency, Professor, Madam. But um, <laughs> where respectability is welcome, but so is just respectability. Yeah. So it's, it's okay to be different, but harmonious working at healing and I'm not a threat to you and you're not a threat to me and if I don't write Latin Icelandic and I write Urdu or Arabic or whatever we can sit around and of course it it invites us to do much harder work yes. around interpreting and translating and being able to speak perhaps not acquire in harmony but a lot of disjointed discordant united chorusing I don't know I don't think there is one answer But it's to say that in terms of movement buildings, movements are difficult things. <laughs> If we're not aware of the complexity yeah. and the dynamism that's within, they're not, they're not straightforward, easy thing. And I think for me, the problem is when we have hierarchies that yeah. then make my own value system not so important, and then it's pushed out and not seen. And I think if we're going to have a gender setting and collective things that call in our histories, our histories are different. Our histories are not all about subjugating us or excluding us, but we can draw together and learn together and perhaps not fit them together neatly, but some sort of jigsaw that's working around healing and trauma and fighting against violence in both respectable and unrespectable ways, but we're just doing it as women together. Um, yeah, so maybe continuums, or maybe not circles, but a continuum of possibilities, I don't know. I think to respect, to respect our difference with, without hierarchical distinctions. And also, I have to say, for those of us who, um, people from the global south, it, we, you know, we, we, ask people, hey, remember we are colonized people and it's part of our history. I think what your two presentations have given us is also a reminder to us that even within Europe, there are different stories, different histories. I, I've, I always remember, it, it was a, um, a Pan America presentation in defense of Salman Rushdie and F. Murray Abraham read a poem by Andrei Zagajewski, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, which was so powerful I've never forgotten it, because he comes from Splot, and it was a poem about how it has been divided all the time, and there was a sentence in there that I just like, you can imagine F. Murray Abraham declaiming this, you know. Must every city become Jerusalem and every man a Jew? He got that and he thought, oh my God, there are so many histories of disruption and division and it was such a powerful metaphor in that moment about belonging and disruption and how to cope with a sense of loss and placelessness. And I, I cite that because, you know, despite all my passion for history in 19th century, it was in that moment that I really remembered the differential histories that we were struggling with. You know, me, my example, because I grew up in England, I always remember the Irish, but I seldom remember, you know, as far as I'm concerned, 19th century history, we did the unification of, and it was over. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And we have to be responsible for remembering that as well. And as you say, there are differential jigsaws that we need to put together because there are situations in which the women who look to us like the empowered are facing different kinds of dispossession in their own spaces, in their own spaces. And 
and we don't always remember that. Thank you, Anna. Can I just check whether um, anyone else wants to come in on that? So, uh, thank you, Magda. Do you want to come in? And then Tatiana? Well, I just wanted to add on the question about the movement building. And from my perspective, uh, the, at the transnational sort of level, uh, the most important thing uh, is to kind of redirect the transfers of knowledge. And I have the feeling that uh, you know, like uh, for Eastern Europe, the Western Europe or the United States was always the point of reference when it came to what feminism is and, and you know, certain concepts and everything. And what is, what's, what is lacking is the connection between Eastern Europe and the Global South. Uh, and uh, I think this is, this is something that um, I would love to see being more uh, dynamic, in, so to speak, so be happening more often because I think there is a lot of m not similarities, but certain points where certain connectivities, connectivities could be made, I think. So to answer the question about the movement. Thank you, thank you, Valena. And Tatiana? Yeah, so about the building movements, I've been trying to build movements, <laughs> I've been taking part in building movements for 20 years now, and uh, when it comes to immigrants, uh, I, and immigrant women especially, I can say that we were, when we organized the, the co -found, uh, founded this organization, we were very well received by Icelandic feminist movement, but still they had you know, some pre-notions on what we should be doing, or how we should be, because they were trying to teach us the way they have done uh, their work, so we had to find our own voice, or voices actually, because we were so different uh, uh, there. But the, the trouble that we have, the problem that we have in building movement and activism is that women just don't have time for that. <laughs> Honestly, you know, when you move to a country, you don't have your, your support of, of your group. You have to learn so many things, and, and you have to work, as I said, most of the work, and, and so, um, I, I, I noticed, well, not, not everyone, we, we have built quite a lot, quite, quite a strong movement, I would think, but you also notice a lot of burn, burnout mm -hmm. in, in women. So this is why I think that in, in, the, in countries like Iceland that are so advanced in, in, in gender equality and everything, we also need, it needs to be sort of, we need a push from, from or pull from the, uh, from the institutions from what is already out there, what Icelandic women have fought for hundred and something years to develop. I think that also needs to open to diversity within the, the women in, in Iceland. And I'm sure it's not only Iceland, it's Germany, it's Sweden, it's, it's other countries, you know, just uh, European countries, uh, that's what I know. And uh, I think that that, that, is, that, that is the most important. We need to have it in research. We need data, but we also need this paradigm shift. And, and uh, us that have come a long way, that, that are established, we need to create spaces for other, the unheard, the unseen, to be able to be seen, seen and heard and incorporate them in the, um, in the discourse. And this does not always have to be in a form of panel like this, or conference or politics, you know, because some people just simply don't want to do it, but in different ways, but on their own, uh, on their own. And I, uh, my organization, Iceland Women's Rights Organization, has been advocating for a long time that the gender equality should be taught at schools mm. here, and uh, it's taught some, somewhere, not everywhere, but I think when that is, uh, thought it should always be uh, intersectionality and diversity should always, always be taught because uh, Icelandic women come in all shapes and forms. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Tatiana. Kalpana, just checking in. Um, in yeah, yeah I, I'd just like to come in as well. I mean, um, I, I think that that question, that, that point which Tatiana made is so important that, you know, how many people, particularly um, particularly women, have that kind of time and space to kind of be present in those those panels and those conferences? Who you know who have even access to that? 
Um, and yet, in a way, you know, it's those struggles which are really uh, those which impact day to day lives from where the starting point has to be for any kind of solidarity. And I think that's, um, you know, for example, just another experience from from Britain, where um, I know that, you know, groups, um, trade unions, which are working outside of the kind of traditional trade union structure, which has been incredibly exclusive of um, women workers of color, well, of course, some of the most exploited and also some of the real, you know, keeping the economy going. But those trade unions which are trying to build a different model of trade unionism, you know, they've started with the struggles of, you know, for example, care workers, right? And the kind of conversations you have when, when that organizing is happening has been not only about, you know, the day-to-day -day conditions we experience being the same, but also about um, where people have come from. So experiences from Latin America and experiences from Africa and those common uh, and different colonial histories, for example. So it's those kind of spaces, I think, the kind of connections which are being made, which are really exciting and important. And also just going back to history, um, the fact that those, you know, connections across the global south, connections of anti-colonial struggles were there historically and kind of need to be in a way revived um, away from those those global fora of, you know, the United Nations and, you know, Beijing and Cairo and all of those which are so controlled and so um, so colonial in so many ways. Um, you know, there were all these connections already. People talked about, you know, Ireland, the anti-colonial struggle there, and I know all of the links with with uh, India, for example. You know, so so I think it's about rediscovering those direct connections and reframing them for our current moment. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. Okay, panel, so we have some questions and we haven't got a huge amount of time. So I'm going to ask folk to be intentional um, in terms of answering. Yeah, yes, Stella, I was trying to kind of use language, you know, like intentional as the, the kind of code for, you know, we're, all, we're unruly women and have a tendency to misbehave. So, um, but, but we, we, we have to kind of honor the rules of time just for a moment. So these are the questions that we, we've, we've got. So. Um, a question as to why African countries are still using penal codes from 1930 and why is it commonly those colonized by the British? So I don't know if anybody can just answer that one like that. Um, anyone want to jump in with that one? I've got some thoughts, but please. Um, ben, I think this came up when, when you actually first spoke. Um, I don't know. Um... There have been changes, there have been attempts at changes, but I think the, at the heart of the matter is that we are all still living under notions of the nation state that were inherited through, by the colonialists. And in a sense, there's a set, not to validate the British systems, but there's a sense in which the British legal systems were, uh, were less egregious than the French Code Noir. So they were less up in your face about the need for change. That's one. But I also think there was probably at some point insufficient attention paid to the underlying assumptions, um, partly because the criminal system was for the long, longest time a system of last resort. What, what do I mean by that? At home today in Ghana, we actually do still have parallel systems of law, the traditional systems as well as the, 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 the national legal system. And the traditional systems still govern much of our, you know, marriage, but the, the, the rituals of intimacy, for want of another want of a better word. Um, and so there is also therefore a tendency for, to, to turn to those adjudicatory systems for, for sort of minor civil offenses. Okay, so by the time you get to the criminal system, things have totally broken down. And, and you're therefore 
no longer in an atmosphere where you, you can judge or control as much. The interesting thing about Ghana is that we've got to the point, partly because we have a hugely influential Asante Hini, who, the, you know, the, the emperor of the Asante, who has been very successful. There have been cases that came up in the national courts which stymied and got stuck. And he basically said, but we've always known how to deal with this. And they've gone on for so long, the judicial system agreed to let him try the traditional systems of adjudicature. And he has managed to solve chieftaincy, land, etc., disputes that have gone on for literally two, three decades because all the parties agreed to the to the adjudicatory system that were not based on the British, um, what's the word, Contentious, contentious legal, legal system. So there's been a change, and, but integrating that change fully. You know, we do have alternative systems of, 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 of justice resolution even within those, but they're, they're voluntary. They're, when people agree, we don't want to go this way. Um, why we have not yet got to a fully integrated system? I don't know. Bureaucracies take a long time to change, and I think it took a long time for people to fully think through the philosophical differences behind the different systems that make you realize you need to change. But the changes are coming. It's, it's not just Ghana. We've seen it in places like Rwanda, for instance. The, 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 the recourse to the indigenous systems, but they operate as parallel systems. You know. It's a good question. I don't fully have an answer. Maybe a, a Ghanaian legal person could, could challenge me and say, actually, they've changed more than you think they have. I need to study the Fourth Republican Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> just, just mindful of kind of the other questions that are, are sitting there. And this one um, feels particularly um, important at the moment. If I think about, you know, a queer community in Kakuma camp who were attacked um, again last night. Um, uh, you know, there's a question uh, online. What are your thoughts on the need for intersectional feminist women and queer persons to get into politics as a way to bring change rather than just activism. So um, we've got like four and a half minutes left. So people, any, any thoughts on that one? So may I? Yes, please. Um, I, I participated in elections last in January and I lost. Um, I didn't go to parliament. One of the biggest stumbling blocks to my race that was always thrown at me is she is pro-LGBTIQ. Mm -hmm. We cannot have a radical queer feminist going to parliament. And it was used by the Christians, the culturalists, the anti-feminists, the anti-queers. And I think for me that it also goes to the question of penal reform. Penal reform is possible. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible, but we don't have enough people pushing for reform from the point of this penal code does not work for us. Mm -hmm. The penal code privileges privilege. It privileges power. It protects yeah. those in state power. So the ones who are working to make sure it stays and it's entrenched within our judicial system and it is the overall for litigation are those who benefit from it. So queers and poor people and immigrants and dirty women and the scum of the earth in society are not represented and don't have the power and are not organizing. But if we organize, we can reform we our penal codes because I think that penal reform is possible. If more queers got into parliament, it's difficult. It's embarrassing. They bring your life and throw it there. They bring your panties with its blood and they throw it out onto the public media. But we can utilize all those forms of shaming and ridiculing yeah. and depowering us to, to speak truth to power and our own power and to break the penal code system. I think it's possible. 
It's just that we lack the tools and the language and we haven't organized well enough. No. And we need to claim some of that privilege in order to penetrate the yes. spaces. We, we haven't done it enough as yes. yet, but we can. And so I'm saying more people in parliament, more queers in homophobic countries. The thing, yeah. I think so. The thing that's so distressing is when you see people who you know present themselves as basically in solidarity with certain kinds of human rights, etc. And you want to ask them, okay, so at what point do you decide this person is no longer a citizen? You know, suddenly, if you occupy a certain kind of body, you're not a citizen. Why? And I have yet, you know, that, that let, let's just bring it down to, do you believe in the ethic of belonging and citizenship? Do you actually believe it? So I'm just gonna, because of time, I'm just gonna ask us to get ready to wind down. Uh, on that point, um, I recommend that people read um, M. Jackie Alexander's yeah. awesome piece on not everybody can be a citizen. Yeah. If folk yeah. haven't read that, just please get in there and read it. It's like she just schools us on neocolonialism, nationhood and citizenship yeah. and, and, the, and queer identity. Yeah. Um, so just, just to kind of finish this off before I'm going to get sacked by these people as a chair. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> can I ask all panel members, each panel member, to just drop, and I, I really apologise to, to the folk online who didn't have their questions answered. You know, I'll, I'll try and find a strategy to have panel members get in there and answer later. Um, just to give, like, a really brief closing remark on what all of this means in terms of reimagining feminist justice, right? Because that's what we're talking about. You know, how do we come through the colonial imagination and the colonial projects and all and so forth to a place where we can reimagine feminist justice. So like literally one sentence, two sentences. Bam, Kalpana, I'm gonna start with you because you're online. So, I'd, you know, to start with you. Okay, that's a, that's a lot, but- I know, I know, just one, a quick one, quick one. <laughs> I mean, you know, for me, it's it, it goes back to this thing that feminist justice, you know, you it depends who you are, where you are, and you have to define it yourself, and you have to have that recognized and respected. Um, but at the same time, I think we can talk about um, feminist justice has to be transformative. It has to be about, you know, the justice part of it also is really, really uh, important. So in a way... Um, I do think we can go beyond difference as well. You know, I think there's that whole idea that we, we recognize difference, but we also think about solidarities and we also think about some common visions and some, some possibilities of, of, of a future, you know, a future beyond, you know, uh, we haven't talked about the climate, but beyond climate imperialism for climate justice, what would that look like? You know, we have to think of that globally. And so, yeah, I think feminist justice uh, also includes that. Thank you, Kapan. See what I mean about unruly women? I love it, 100%. <laughs> um, um, can I hand over to Tatiana, please? So I'm gonna kind of work that way. So Tatiana, can you give us yeah. some closing remarks, please? Just a few words. I really like this concept of, of your question of citizenship. Who has the right to citizenship? And everybody has the right, every single person has the right to citizenship in his or her own terms. And so to achieve that, we really need to expand. We, we, we need solidarity in all the, both the movements and also the politics and, and institutions and, and opening them up to, to the notion that we are not all the same. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Stella? Right, so my one sentence, feminist justice must be historicized, decolonized, intersectional, inclusive, and plural. Oh, oh. yes, no. <laughs> yes. Okay, Come I'm on, just going to start that. getting all Jamaican <laughs> up as we're ending the conversation. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, Magda, over to you. Yeah, I agree. I think that feminist justice should be inclusive, accessible, 
uh, and I think based in the not obvious connectivities between various locations. Awesome. Which Thank I think you. this was a good example of, and I'm very yeah, grateful yeah. that I, I had a chance to participate in it. Awesome. Thank you. And Abena, over to you. Yeah, I'm going to... We are all mothers, and we have that fire in us of powerful women whose spirits are so angry we can laugh beauty into life and still make you taste the salt tears of our knowledge. Oh, wow. Oh, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, beautiful. So I just want to thank each of you for bringing it today. I want to thank you for being unruly, disruptive, powerful, disrespectful, and respectful woman. I just want to thank you for being that outrageous, outraged, and for bringing just real revolutionary love to this space. And, and Abena, as a daughter of a midwife who ascended to the ancestors last year, my mother also was known for reaching in and turning babies. So when you said that, I almost wept because I just saw, ah, oh, she's here with us. I want to thank you all for your commitment to justice and I'm now going, I believe we can, we're now, we've now got to close this conversation, but we only went four minutes over, so I think we did well. Uh, so sending love to all of you and um, hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Sure.